Elizabeth I reign in 10 minutes. Oh heck, this is gonna have to be a quick one. So of course, she was the child of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, and this made her the half-sister to Mary, who hated her because she was essentially the reason why she had been barred from the succession and her mother had fallen from grace. Now, she actually entered London with Mary's procession after the collapse of Northumberland's coup with the devise of the succession in 1553, um, and she was actually suspected of being involved in the 1554 Wyatt's Rebellion, and she was imprisoned in the Tower, although no evidence was found, so she got away with her life. Now, religious policy is very important for Elizabeth. Now, one of the first things she did when she came to the throne in 1558 uh, was to reinstate the Protestant church, which of course Mary had abolished. Now, this was in two acts called the Religious Settlement Together, the first being the Act of Supremacy, which made Elizabeth supreme governor of the church rather than supreme head of the church because she was a woman, and this meant that every churchman had to swear an oath to the queen, which all of them, bar one, did not do, so she lost all of her bishops, which were Catholics. The other act was the Act of Uniformity, which made a 12 pence fine for missing church, which was known as recusancy, as well as reintroducing the 1553 edition of the English Book of Common Prayer, with a few tweaks to make it more ambiguous towards Catholic, like the black rubric, for example. Now, there was a lot of religious division during her reign, and actually when she came to the throne, pretty much all of England outside of the southeast was Catholic, and she started off with a motto which was Video et Taceo, which means I see everything, but say nothing. Now, Catholic threats increased during her reign, especially with her cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a rival claimant to the throne, but I'll get into that a bit later on. And as such, as well as the deteriorating relationship with Spain, the stricter anti-Catholic laws started to be passed in Parliament from the 1570s onwards. There were also hardline Protestants, who were Puritans and Presbyterians, who also wanted more religious reform, but essentially she stayed fairly neutral and even targeted them during her reign. Now, foreign policy, of course, the Spanish are a huge factor in foreign policy. And she actually started off as an ally to them. Philip even went for her hand in marriage when it looked like Mary was dying, who was his wife, because of Mary's foreign policy they were against the French. Now Elizabeth came out as a Protestant, obviously the Spanish were strongly Catholic, and her aid to the Dutch rebels who were at that time fighting the Spanish in the Netherlands obviously annoyed the Spanish a lot, and she had two trading embargoes against the Spanish for several years. Now when the Spanish got involved in the Rodolfi plot in 1571, which was to have Elizabeth killed, this obviously soured relations, and she further supported the Dutch in covert manners, as well as sending off the uh, people like Sir Francis Drake to go and annoy Spanish shipping. In 1585, she signed the Treaty of Nonsuch with the Dutch, which essentially sent the Earl of Leicester over to the Netherlands to send an English army of, I think, it's around 15,000 strong to help fight the Spanish, so there was open war there. And in 1588, very famously, the Spanish sent the Armada, this huge navy, over to go and invade England, which was then successfully defeated in the English Channel. And this war continued on for the rest of her reign. Uh, a famous notorious example coming on later on in 1596 was the Anglo-Dutch raid on Cadiz, led by the Earl of Essex. So the relations with France actually she starts off at war with the French because of Mary's foreign policy with the Spanish against the French. And the French actually had a large army in Scotland, which was a huge threat. But two years into her reign in 1560, she and Cecil signed the Treaty of Edinburgh, which ensured an end to the hostilities and replaced the old alliance of the French and the Scots with an Anglo-Scots one. In France in 1562, the Huguenot or religious wars started with Catholics against Protestants in different houses there, and Elizabeth supported the Huguenots because she was of course Protestant in 1562 with the Treaty of Hampton Court, sending troops to La Havre, which is known to the English as New Haven, but the French both turned on her and the policy was a disaster. Now two years later, the Treaty of Troy recognised that Calais was completely lost to the English, but the English got a sum of money, and in 1572 there was a huge massacre of French Protestants in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, but they did sign the Treaty of Blau, which essentially pitted themselves uh, against the Spanish, and the marriage negotiations with the Duke of Anjou, one of the brothers to the French king, started in 1579, who then went off and fought in the Netherlands in the early 1580s. Now, in 1584, there was a Treaty of Joinville, which was between the Catholic League, so the French Catholics, and the Spanish, and this was a huge threat if the Spanish and the French got together to attack the English. Now, Scotland was actually a regent of the French of Mary of Guise because of the marriage alliance of her daughter, um, and French troops were actually sent to Scotland to put down a Protestant revolt. However, Elizabeth intervened and sent troops because of the 1560 Treaty of Berwick and helped the Scottish Protestants to win. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots, fled to England seven years after returning to Scotland in 1561, so in 1568 she was in England, but she was imprisoned. Now, her infant son, James VI, became king, but he was a Protestant, so this led to better relations. For example, in 1586, the Second Treaty of Berwick essentially created a Protestant defensive pact between James and Elizabeth, both being Protestants. And in 1587, Mary was finally executed following her involvement in the Babington plot. 
Now let's take a look at some of the government and parliament during this time. So she relied a lot on several key ministers. Now William Cecil was the Baron Burley or the Lord Burley and he was, as um, Lisa Hilton said, the closest to a friend that the Queen would ever have. He was Secretary of State and Lord High Exchequer and he was the anti-war faction at court. He was very level-headed because of course he was involved with the money and money cost a lot uh, with money. He was involved with money and war cost a lot of money to go. So the other, another one very important was Robert Dudley, who was known as the Gypsy. He was the Earl of Leicester, and Elizabeth was said to be emotionally dependent on her by John Guy. He was the master of the horse, and he was more pro-war. He was very flamboyant and did go off to fight in the Netherlands, for example, and he was of the more radical Protestant faction at court. Now, the son of William Cecil was called Robert Cecil, and he led the Privy Council by 1597 and ensured the smooth succession to James VI after her death. Robert de Vreux was actually the stepson of Robert Dudley. He was more important. Impulsive, uh, more impulsive like his stepfather and he um, led several military expeditions against the Spanish and the Irish although he signed a treaty with the Irish when the Queen didn't want this he um, then went off on a bit of a tangent and he rebelled against the Queen and was executed in 1601. So what about the other government? Well Parliament sat 13 times in the 45 year reign as opposed to 26 times in the previous 30 years before Elizabeth. Now there is an argument from Elton saying that there was a, a harmonious relationship between Parliament and the Queen and there is one from Neil saying that it was discord and there was a pure and choir and that this would down the line lead to the English civil war between the king and parliament. Now parliament was mostly called to grant Elizabeth subsidies which was money because she was having huge economic problems at the time um, as well as dealing with Mary Queen of Scots and the Catholic threat but local government at this time uh, continued with the justices of the peace which had been introduced during Henry the Seventh reign and militias being raised in the shires to put down rebellions and things like that. Although more and more gentry class Puritans were being admitted to parliament from the boroughs so from these towns, these mercantile centres. Now, rebellion and plots. Uh, in, the, in 1571, there was the Rodolfi plot, which was backed by the Spanish. The Rodolfi was himself an international banker, with the aim of bringing a 10,000 strong army under the Duke of Alba from the Netherlands to England to wed Mary Queen of Scots to the Duke of Norfolk and replace Queen Elizabeth, but this was foiled. In 1583, there was the Throckmorton plot, which was again backed by the Spanish, with the aim of inviting a French Catholic invasion of the de Guise family, uh, with Henry II invading and the instalment again of Mary Queen of Scots on the throne. And finally, in 1586, the Babington plot was again backed by the Spanish with the aim of a joint Franco-Spanish invasion and the installment of Mary Queen of Scots on the throne, but when this went tits up, essentially they had enough Mary Queen of Scots and she was executed the year later. Now, a year after Mary Queen of Scots arrived in England, so in 1568 she fled to England and then in 1569 the Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland rebelled with 7,000 men to have her recognised as heir. They didn't want to replace her, but they wanted an heir because if Elizabeth died, well, you know, that was going to be the end. There was going to be turmoil once again, but they were put down. Now Ireland saw three major rebellions during Elizabeth's reign because she was trying to consolidate control there. The first Desmond Rebellion from 1569 to 1573 was put down. The second Desmond Rebellion from 1579 to 1583 was more dangerous by nature because it involved the Spanish and the Pope getting involved. And finally the Nine Years War from 1593 to 1603 fought mostly in Ulster, the northern part of Ireland, was dangerous again because the Spanish were involved and sent some 3,000 troops over to intervene. Although ultimately they were successful and uh, the rebellion was put down without a Spanish invasion of England. Finally, the Earl of Essex's rising in 1601 was after his fall from grace when the Queen threatened to remove his monopoly on the sweet wines and so he would go bankrupt essentially, so troops loyal to him were in London, but Robert Cecil had informants in his household and he figured out what the plans were and he sent troops to go and stop them, which was followed by Essex's execution and obviously the Queen would die two years later, safe and sound. So let's have a look at the timeline then. So 1558 obviously is when Elizabeth ascends to the throne after Mary I's death, her half-sister's death, and then the year after she sorts out the religious settlement with the Act of Supremacy and the Act of Uniformity. 1568 is another important year because this was the year in which Mary Queen of Scots, which who was her cousin, arrived in England causing the uh, Northern Rising the year after in 1569, and then the Rodolfi plot in 1571. Of course, because she was in England, English Catholics had a figurehead around which to rally. 
So really, this was a dangerous situation for the Queen. 1572, a lot of things happened in this year. You have the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Hundreds of, um, or possibly even tens of thousands um, of French Protestants are murdered in the streets in Paris, for example. Lord Walsingham um, saw this, who would later become the spy master. But then the French reassure the English with the Treaty of Bois. And of course, the Dutch captured Den Briel on the 1st of April, the sea beggars, the Chosen, which then really kicked off the Dutch revolt in the Netherlands. 1588, of course, another important um, important year was the defeat of the Spanish Armada, which was sent to capture England and the death of Leicester, and of course in 1603, the death of Elizabeth herself. So thank you very much for watching, thanks very much for the Patreons for making this possible, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Tune in again soon, and that's my 10 minutes up.